Hey, Michael with X-Force PC here. Just a quick note, today is August 24th of 2019. So if you're watching this video years or months or whatever down the road, bear in mind what the date is here. All of the features you're gonna see here are included in the final release of 1140. Also, watch the video description once we have enough beta testers for this 1140, we're going to post that in the video description. So stop emailing Austin once you see in the video description that we have enough beta testers. Okay, now on to the video. Okay, all right, so Austin Meyer coming at you from uh, Mike's Playhouse, as always, x 4 BC on a kind of uh, chill Saturday morning. Um, okay, so we're about to release the next X-Plane beta, but I'm going to do something just a little bit differently here. So X-Plane uh, 11 is now in the hands of over 100,000 people, and so uh, we're about to come out with X-Plane 1140 beta, but the problem is, if we put that beta out in the installer, so anybody that just checks the beta box gets on their installer, we'll have possibly, in theory, up to like 100,000 people getting the beta like instantly. And um, if there's bugs in the beta, that's kind of uh, a, a pain in the butt way, shall we say, to find out about bugs. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna release uh, a little private beta or alpha. Well, I guess we'll call it an alpha, pre-beta, we'll call this an alpha. Mike's like nodding mutely over there. Mike's in the room, hey! Hey, okay. So um, we're going to release a, uh, a little alpha just to people to watch this video, say, this weekend. And then um, if anybody comes back here and the video is gone, you can tell them that that means we got all the beta testers we can handle. So here's check, check the video description. I don't want to get rid of the video, oh. but check the video description. We'll put a note in the description that says, okay, we've got enough. People. Enough beta testers. Okay, right. So here's the name of the game. I'm going to uh, just literally, I've, I've already built the 1140. I guess we should call it Alpha 1 probably. I've already built it and batched it up into a big old zip file. And then people that email me asking for it in response to this video, we're just going to send it to you by WeTransfer. And here's how it's going to work. Download the latest X-Plane using the installer with the beta box checked. Okay, that gets you the latest of everything, latest airplane, scenery, resources, executables, everything. Email me, and I'll just email you a little WeTransfer link, or, or, or maybe I'll spin it up as a, uh, a BitTorrent or something like that, depending on how much time I have. Okay, Mike is trying to get my attention. Yeah, what you got? Recommendation, if you have room, make a copy of your X-Plane folder. Just yeah. copy and paste it to another spot on your hard drive, and that way you're not messing with your main X-Plane install. Right, if something is wrong with the beta, as of course there will be or something, you I'm decide sure. you just, you're done with it. If right. You just want to go back to the way you were. Right, which you can certainly do. So um, email me. My email is austin, A-U-S-T-I-N, spell like the capital of Texas, at xplane.com. And you should know how to spell xplane at this point in the game. So um, austinxplane.com, say, hey, give me the 1140 beta, and I'll send you uh, a, a little uh, WeTransfer link, probably, unless I decide to spin up a BitTorrent. Um, and uh, what you'll do is you'll take this little uh, zip file and expand it. And all you're going to see is some new executables in there. It's the simplest thing in the world. And uh, maybe some new files to drop into the resources folder or something like that. So just put them in the right place manually and, and fire it up. You'll have your 1140 beta. And uh, hopefully we'll get, we typically get like, what, a couple hundred comments on a video or something like that. And if we get as many people asking for the beta as we do comments, we've got a couple hundred beta testers, which is uh, probably a good number for us to, to do here. And um, so, uh, Is there a particular subject that you would want them to put in their email? I check all my email, so it really doesn't even matter. I mean, if you want to save time and be as efficient as me, say, give me the 1140 beta. Done. But I mean, when they have like a bug report or a comment about it. Uh, bugs are supposed to go to the, well, you can send bugs to the bug reporter, but for the 1140 beta, for bugs related to the 1140 beta, just send them to me and just, I mean, just put, put people always from the subject. Here's what I think is wrong. Now, it is too late for feature request at this point for 11:40. Okay, um, plenty of people email me. You know, oh, I want you know a, a big new feature, and then while I got you, let me think of another big feature. Oh, let me jam two more feature requests in the email. Unfortunately, I don't have time for that, right? Because literally one customer could drive the entire business if we go down uh, if we go down that road. So I don't have time for feature requests where like everything you can think of, you just kind of put into an email for someone else to do for you. Sorry, the the business has gotten a little too big to operate that way, unfortunately. Um, so you will want to stick to 
bug reports and um, bug reports for 1140. Yeah, just email me, ask for the beta, I'll send it to you, and then feedback bug reports. And, and this is just getting 1140 a little earlier than everyone else. Don't stop watching this video if you want to know what 1140 does. Because I'm about to tell ya. Let's head to the whiteboard. Okay, so uh, I've decided to draw, basically 1140 is all about flight model improvements. Um, they're, we're just putting flight model improvements into 1140, nothing else. And when I write flight model improvements down in text, it's almost impossible to really understand what the heck I'm trying to say. And if I try and show it to you in X-Plane, then we're talking like, you know, five or 10 or 15% differences in various different types of aircraft performance, which is really not that informative to look at. So I decided to hit the whiteboard this time to show you what's new for X-Plane 1140. And we're just gonna, you know, work through the, through the items here. All right, so let's start here. Uh, exhaust thrust. So, okay, Mike, you look like you're hesitating. You're going for the camera or something? You're okay? No, you're all right. Good. You're good. Okay, all right. You were like doing like this on the camera like I was doing something wrong. I was wrong. trying to consider if I should zoom in, but I think they can see it. Okay. Well, I mean, we'll, we'll upload this to nice high res. They can expand this thing so the, the, the board's, you know, as big as our monitor. They'll be able to see everything. Okay. So, exhaust thrust. So, as it turns out, exhaust thrust in uh, Pratt & Whitney PT-6 might be uh, responsible for as much as like 10% or something like that, like a significant dose. Maybe 10% is a little high, but it's a significant dose of the total thrust of a Pratt & Whitney PT-6 engine comes from the exhaust, not the propeller. And I used to think that exhaust was absolutely negligible, but then someone sent me some references showing the uh, propeller or shaft horsepower and the effective horsepower, where the effective horsepower has the exhaust thrust added in. And uh, the way you do the math to go between power and thrust is, uh, uh, it completely opaque and undefined in the way uh, Pratt & Whitney or the industry defined it. It has very little connection to actual physics. It's more like a, a correction factor type thing, which makes it really awkward. But nevertheless, um, I still managed to figure out what the correction factor should be in X-Plane. And so if you go to Plane Maker Engines screen, you will uh, have uh, a little exhaust thrust uh, factor that you can enter. And it has some little guidance if you hold the mouse. You know, you know, you know how you hold the mouse over a, a number in Plane Maker and the description comes up, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, you're nodding mutely again. But yeah. yes? Okay, yeah. yes. Okay. So... I call it tool, tool tips, tips or help tips or something like that. And that'll tell you what uh, type of value to put into the exhaust system. So uh, now we have exhaust thrust and that definitely does add uh, thrust. Oh, one quick note, you need to turn the experimental flight model on to see all this stuff. You make sure you go to the settings. What do you call the settings in the upper right world? Because there's two settings the in X-Plane. There's the like upper left three, and upper right. Well, the, uh, I always go to the upper right. It's yeah. like three little bars with dots on Yeah, the, the graphic top. equalizer bars. It's trying to be a graphic equalizer icon. Go up to the little graphic equalizer icon in the upper right, and in the main settings, make sure you turn on experimental flight model. That's the only way all the stuff is going to get turned on for you in the new beta, if you get it, okay? So, um, so we now have exhaust thrust. In Plane Maker, you enter the exhaust thrust ratio, and sure enough, enough, we'll, we'll tack some additional thrust on there uh, to give you exhaust thrust. Another cool one, now we talked about this in a video. Do you remember when we talked about wake turbulence Xavian. in Xavian, how Xavian leaves the little uh, eggs of wake behind it? And I said, oh, well, I should put that in X-Plane because you were like, well, is X-Planes is good? And I had to admit, no, it wasn't. Well, it was a well, customer question. A customer question, I, got it. I believe, well, I asked and then I think, no, you're right. I asked, and you mm. said, well, now that you mention it, I will put it in X-Plane. Okay. It down. Yeah. Well, I did it. So uh, in 1140, the, uh, the airplane leaves little breadcrumbs, if you will, behind it that are wake, and they move in the wind, and they settle. And uh, if you hit Command M, you know where you see the flight model in the external view? So switch to the external view and hit Command M, and you'll be able to see the wake coming down. And as I recall in X-Plane, I even made it good enough to actually expand the wake from each wingtip separately. So, uh, all right, you're going to check the uh, keys here. Let's well, uh, see on a PC, it's not command. It's, oh, it's uh, what? I would assume it's control M. Yeah, control yeah. M. Yeah, that's it. That's it. You're, you're getting it. Okay, so command M in a Mac, control M in a PC. All right, Mike was just testing, the, testing it over on a, on a Windows machine just out of view. So we got exhaust thrust, and we have really proper wake. Uh, descending from the airplane, uh, and, and so you can go set up for AI airplanes. Get a bunch of AI airplanes flying, some big ones, if you got the guts, <laughs> right? Because the bigger they are, the more wake ones. And then you can get up behind them, hit uh, Command or Control M. Oh, you see the little eggs. Yeah, you see the little eggs kind of off the wings. 
and then you maneuver in and it'll, you know, it'll, it'll kick you around uh, as you get into that wake. So, and that wake will agree with what you see in Xavion. So if you fly X-plane with Xavion attached to it, you'll see the little eggs come down in Xavion. If you enter them, sure enough, boom, you're gonna get hit with oh, turbulence. Oh, it's just like the real world, just like the world. Well, it's almost like the real world. In the real world, it's so violent that I've actually hit my head on the cockpit and, and hurt my neck. Uh, you don't get that reproduced in the sim, do you? In the sim, all you do is, you know, the airplane kind of does this. The real world's a, well, it's like, a, it's like a boxing match simulator versus actually boxing, right? Yeah. The simulator can only do so much. And are you but, calculating that in a very accurate way, or are you just kind of throwing in some vibrations? Uh, I'm throwing in some motion of the air, and then the motion of the air interacts with the X-plane so aircraft model pretty damn well. So looking at what the air is doing, yes. and not just making it up Correct. And flippantly doing Correct. Okay. Correct. The answer to your question is yes, we move the air. And if you want, oh, and if you would command M the right number of times to see the, all the forces on the wing, you'll see the forces on the wing, you know, kind of, go, you know, flexing all across as you're in the moving air that is the weight turbulence from the other airplane. Yeah, this control M or command M feature is probably something people should have been doing for a long time. Oh, yeah. Time. Oh, I've it's had this really since X-Plane cool. 1, basically. It's really cool. Yeah, it's been in there right since the beginning, and I just keep making it better as I find new cool you know, things to add to it. So anyway, weight turbulence and exhaust thrust are two new features for 1140. Another one, uh, delta V uh, angle. So what, what does that let mean? Me, let, well, me, let me see if I can guess. Okay, you guess, go. Uh, based on that diagram, <clears throat> I'm assuming the downward force of the air acting on the fuselage? Close. I mean, yes, kind of. I mean, yes, technically, yes. But let me back it out. I'm not looking at this at the force. I'm looking at this as the velocity, okay? I'm tracking the velocity of the air coming from the prop. And then whatever forces result from that velocity are forces that apply in X-plane. So when you say tracking the force, well, yes, but what we're really doing is tracking the velocity and then finding the force as a result of the velocity, you see? And it's really on the wing. So I'm showing a VTOL tilt wing here. And I'm not saying such an airplane even exists, okay? But there are VTOL tilt wing concepts. Okay, now my VTOL that I'm building with beta technologies actually is not a tilt wing. We have a different way of, uh, of doing vertical negative landing because we just want fewer moving parts. But a lot of people are doing tilt wings. And so um, what is gonna happen happen if you've got downwash coming from the propeller, but the airplane is also moving forwards. You see, the airplane's moving forwards, downwash is coming off the prop. How is the air going to interact with that wing? That's extremely important to a tilt rotor, tilt wing aircraft. And so now we do a better job, and we never do a perfect job with these type of dynamics, right? That's literally an impossibility. It can't happen. We're not going to simulate every molecule of air. But we do a better job of having that prop wash really come out aimed with the propeller initially and then kind of tilting back over time. And another case this happens is just a regular airplane uh, scooting prop wash back over the vertical stabilizer and across when takeoff and landing. So, some guy up in Canada took his uh, RV airplane out into the, in, onto the ramp in Canada in the winter time. It was like negative 20 degrees or something. And he had his mechanic stand out there with a smoke bomb maker type thing in front of the propeller while he sat in the airplane and ran the engine up so we could look at the smoke getting kicked back from the prop over the fuselage and back onto the vertical stabilizer of his airplane to see how the propeller it really moved the, uh, the air. And um, this is one of the results of him running that experiment and showing me what he found. It's how the air initially is aimed with the prop and then moves with the wind. And it applies to VTOLs, but it also applies to tail draggers taking off and landing in a crosswind because the propeller is initially kicking the air back, but then the air might start to hit off in its own direction later on back behind the airplane, you see? So the angle at which uh, that prop wash hits the air is absolutely critical. Okay, so at any rate, uh, how the air uh, is kicked back from the propeller and then over time and space, starts to move with the local uh, airflow is a thing that matters both to VTOLs and tail draggers and crosswinds, and we've improved that model. Okay, let's come up to the next one here. Spiral uh, wash angle. So let's look at the uh, prop wash coming back from the propeller. We all agree the prop kicks the air back, right? Boom, 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 the prop kicks the air back. But what's not quite as obvious is it also circles the air around, right? It circles the air around. And so the trick is to figure out 
how much does the prop kick the air back? And that's actually very easy to figure out. That's just conservation of momentum. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. This is like completely proven, right? So we absolutely can guarantee that if an airplane has a thousand pounds of thrust at a hundred knots and the prop wash must be, you know, X knots. This is fundamental equal and opposite reaction. x -Men's had this right for decades because it's an easy one. The harder one <laughs> that I'm improving for x 1140 is, what about that spiral? You know, how much does the, the propeller drag the air around in a spiral? And Mike, how would you guess I should figure that out? How would you guess how much does the pro, how much does your spiral? Can you like think of a way to, and I've thought about this for months. So your, your ability to think of something <laughs> like in 30 seconds is okay. So there's two ways that I, well, there's three ways we do it. One, uh, we look at the lift over drag ratio of the propeller. And here's what I mean. Let's say the propeller puts out 10 pounds of lift and one pound of drag. Well, isn't that drag dragging the air around with it? And so if a propeller puts out 10 pounds of lift and one pound of drag, then probably for every 10 knots of prop rush we have this way, we have one knot of spiral. You see, that's an approximation because that, I mean, basically it's the drag is what's dragging the thing around in a circle, right? Dragging the weight around a circle. Another way of looking at it is propulsive efficiency. Let's say the propeller is 90%, no, let's say 80%, 80% efficient. Well, if a propeller is 80% efficient in turning power into thrust, which x determines by looking at the thrust and, and the power from the engine, well then, that extra 20% has to go somewhere, doesn't it? If a propeller is 80% efficient at bringing engine horsepower to the airstream, which x is very, very good at figuring out, well, where's that extra 20% going? I guess to this wash. A lot of it, not some is just being lost to heat and turbulence, but a lot of it is going to the rotational wash of the stream. You see, so we have these ways we can kind of deduce what that spiral must be. And then find the third way is NACA tech reports, right? Just aerodynamic reports. And all they all come from World War II, okay? World War II is where all these tech reports come from. It's World War II when the government was looking at all this stuff and maybe it was classified back then and it's been published since. But when you look back at like basically almost everything you see here, it's almost all World War II tech reports that I go back to to see how my theory compares with the actual practice that they found in their wind tunnels and flight test uh, back in 1940. So kind of strange, 1940 was like the heyday of learning all this stuff and we're just starting to see it now <laughs> in a retail sim. But um, so at any rate, the third way is to then verify my theory against flight test results that were taken in 1940 and published uh, in NACA tech reports. Okay, so let's move on. Next, uh, oh, oh, and so why does this matter? Why does the spiral matter so much? And the answer is, it's the spiral, again, that hits that vertical stabilizer in a tail dragger in the crosswind that you really need to get right to have your crosswind takeoffs and landings right, especially takeoffs. So there's all sorts of prop wash hitting that, spiraling around and hitting the vertical stab. And also, to some degree, putting a twist on the uh, tail and also the wings. So the spiral prop wash matters, especially on the vertical stab, because it's one of the things that cocks the nose of the aircraft uh, off to the left, requiring you to, to get on right rudder. Um, so that's that. Okay, next, wash across disc. So it used to be with X-Plane that the prop wash through a disc was just done by momentum conservation. Oh, like I, was, like I was just talking about two seconds ago. But with helicopters, it gets a little different. Do you think, let's say a helicopter's moving forwards, okay, let's say, He's moving forwards at 50 knots, okay? And so this guy's moving forwards at 50 knots. And air is being kicked down through the disc, obviously, as he bears his weight. And for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, air comes down. Do you think the prop wash is the same across the entire disc? Well, no, no. In the front, it's definitely gonna be different than in the back. And How what, exactly it's going to be different, I don't know. And why would it be different? Why would it not be the same? Because um, you're getting that effect up there, sort of. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it's, it's like changing over time. The upper right yeah, you pointed here. It's very much like that. In other words, let's say that this, this prop is putting a, a constant downforce on the air. Well, initially, the air is not going to be affected very much because it hasn't had any time to be affected because the prop has just entered clean air. And then as you get farther back, the air will have had, you know, a tenth of a second, you know, a quarter of a second, a fifty, you know, whatever it is, to start accelerating. And by the time you get to the back of the disc, well, the air has had all of this time to get accelerated down. And so by the time you get to the back of the disc, the air is just going, boom, and just getting dumped down like it's being pumped down by the prop, you see? So the air uh, is really getting kicked down a lot more in the back 
because um, because it's had time to get accelerated, right? There is accelerated over time. So. Um, how much is the next question? And I tried uh, an equation that I just kind of pulled almost out of thin air that said, okay, how about at the very leading edge, it must be zero. At the trailing edge, it must be twice as much as conservation you know, theory implies. And so it's exactly, it averages out to a conservation of momentum. Well, that's the thing. And if that you happens. Know what it is at the beginning and the end, you can figure out everything. Yeah, it, yeah you can, I'm willing to interpolate in the middle. The question is how fast you have to go for that to happen. And I said, well, let's try, we have to go to prop watch speed. So the prop watch speed is 40 knots. Then at 40 knots, it's doubled here, it's zero here, it's half in the middle and conservation is, is, is maintained. That was just my first guess at it. Well, with uh, our electric VTOL that we're flying at Beta Technologies, <laughs> we started looking and we would move our VTOL forwards at how much the airplane wanted to tilt up, right? The airplane would kind of tilt up as it moved forwards. And it was tilting up be partially as we started to move forwards in a, in a situation like this, even though our airplane is not a tilt wing, uh, because we were getting more downwash in the back, less downwash in the front, which meant the front of the rotor disc was more effective than the back of the rotor disc. Right, the front was more effective than the back, which caused the airplane to, to, to pitch up. And so I compared my pitch up in X-plane to our pitch up from flight test, and I just tweaked that little equation that I guessed, just barely, I hardly had to touch it. My first guess was so close, it was ridiculous. But I tweaked that equation until what, the, just the, you know, the balancing of how fast you have to go to get this effect uh, to exactly match the flight test of our real airplane. And I did that, I got something that, that follows conservation of momentum, um, applies as the speed builds up, and matches a flight test of our actual EV toll, so we know we got it right. So we, what can I say, I guess we kind of sort of did our own informal internal NACA tech report there to verify the theoretical findings. So uh, it's pretty cool, and you'll notice the rotor disc is gonna flat more, and airplanes will wanna pitch up more if they're VTOLs like this, and it's because you got uh, more thrust in the front and less in the back, because that air is kicked down in the back. All right, uh, let's go to the next one. Delay wash. Okay, this one's just a teeniest bit tricky, but it's really awesome. So as an airplane raises the nose, the wing gets more lift, right? So, you know, I've got the little thing indicating the, air, the nose is coming up, the wing gets more lift. You agree? Mm -hmm. As the wing gets more lift, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. Whatever the lift of the wing is, downwash comes down. And that downwash strikes the tail. Which produces even more nose up. Which produces, exactly, produces even more nose up. Exactly, exactly. So as you raise the nose, there's more lift, which pushes the tail down, which pushes the nose up more. x plane has been doing this for 20 years now, or 25 years. But here's what x plane has never done before. There's something you didn't think of just now. It takes a fraction of a second for that downwash to make it back to the horizontal stabilizer. You see, it's not and instant. Instantaneously applying that. Yes, X plane's been doing it instantly because it just looks the lift, looks the downwash, applies the downwash to the tail. Seems perfectly reasonable, but it didn't consider the fact that it took a fraction of a second for that wash to make it back to the tail. And what that means is the real airplane. In the real airplane, when you raise the nose, this is initially in relatively undisturbed air. And it's only after a fraction of a second that the downwash hits the tail. So the real airplane resists the nose coming up. It resists the, the, that nose up tendency, but the X-plane simulated aircraft wasn't because it was just applying that push down force in the tail instantly. As a result, the aircraft in X-plane is a little more squirrely or sensitive. How many times have you heard people oh, say, yeah. X-plane's too <laughs> sensitive? How many times have you heard that? A million? Oh, oh yeah, a lot. A million, 10 million? Not as many as pulls to the left on takeoff. Uh, yeah, well, with pulling the left on takeoff, of course, is completely accurate. But, um, you probably heard it a lot, it's too sensitive. And the reason was, sure, it was applying the perfectly reasonable laws of physics for downwash into the stab, but it was applying it instantly rather than after a delay. So in 1140, we have what's called delayed wash, which is kind of a little bit of a poor man's approximation. I don't actually tr track each little molecule or cubic centimeter of air back to the tail to get that delay. That would take up too much frame rate. All right, it hurts in the frame rate department too big. So I did something a little sneaky. I said, well, if we're moving the nose up at 10 degrees per second, then whatever the instantaneous downwash is, just subtract a little bit from that based on 
an onset rate of 10 degrees per second, like uh, multiplied by the time it takes <laughs> to get from here to here, which is simply the speed of the airplane, like divided by the length. You see, it's like one of those types of things. In other words, I don't actually track the air coming back here. I just say, well, wait a minute. If we're moving at 100 knots, you know, and it's, and it's this distance here, then it takes a tenth of a second for the air to make it back. So we will just base the downwash on an angle of attack that existed a tenth of a second ago, which we approximate by taking our current uh, angle of attack and and backing it off to what it was a tenth of a second in the past and applying that on the tail. <laughs> okay, terribly explained, but I use basic algebra to avoid destroying the frame rate. <laughs> and with this little basic algebra that has no impact on frame rate at all, we get the same impact of a delayed downwash. And so now the airplane has a more stable kind of solid feel to it, and this is the reason. All right, let's go to the next one. All right, this one is really weird. Okay, let's say this is the horizontal stabilizer of an airplane, okay? And let's say it's lifting up like this. Whenever an airplane wing lifts, it's got these tip vortices, right? Oh, yeah, I've seen that in yeah. smoke many times. Yeah, you've seen smoke many, many times. Or going through a cloud. You'll see right, that. yeah, that, it's like this. And the reason is there's low pressure up here and high uh, pressure down here. To draw the air exactly. That low pressure. Exactly. Exactly. High, low pressure here for the lift, high pressure, the air is drawn into the low pressure. And of course it gets drawn in, and then of course once it gets that kind of swirl going on, it starts to bump into the other side. It's like, oh, I don't need to keep going this way, and so it kind of goes into swirl, and that's your, your cyclone. This implies the horizontal stabilizer plays a role in lift. It does, maybe, to some degree. I'm doing this with a horizontal stab, not a wing, even though the wing is probably like 50 times more. <laughs> I'm drawing this as, as a horizontal stab for a reason. It applies both horizontal stabs and wings. Yeah, horizontal stabs might produce a little uplift or a little downlift, so usually that's not very why much. They have those little things at the end of the exactly. Wing. That's why you have things like winglets and end plates and stuff like that is to stop the air from making it around. Is the air kind of goes, eh, oh, I can't make it. Eh. You see, and now you don't get these gigantic, huge weight vortices. So these winglets or end plates that you see on the end, on the winglet, it's normally something that just comes up. Uh, sometimes on horizontal stabs, you'll see them go up and down above. They're called end plates. And that just breaks the air's ability to very easily get around. And uh, X-Plane has, has understood this. X-Plane said, okay, well, if we've got an end plate there, we're gonna have uh, less of the air making it around. Now, what about this? This is what's called a T-tail, right? You're in a, you see you're in an airplane here and here's a prop, the prop in the wings and a vertical stab and the horizontal stab. Does this act as an end plate here that stops lateral flow? Uh, it would reduce it. Well, I would say it has no impact because it's in the middle. The air still goes around out on either side, you see? In the middle, it doesn't act as an end. Well, it would act as an end plate if you were in a side slip. If you're in a side slip, so the air is coming from one side, it would block it. But if you're not going to the side, the air still, I mean, it's not being blocked, you see? Right. Here's the thing. Older versions of X-Plane got confused and they thought that this was an end plate. Oh, really? Yeah, older versions of X-Plane, would, they would see this and they would think it was that. Does it include 1135? Yes. Okay, so this isn't going to be fixed until 1140. It is fixed in 1140. Right, I so 1140's not out. It will be within, <laughs> it will be before we post the video. Well, the beta you have is alpha. To, right, you have to get the beta. No, this is a bug fix for the beta. But if you don't want to do the beta or alpha or whatever. Well, you're going to have to wait until 1140 goes final. 1145. Yeah. Oh, I, everything on sport I've already done. And this is a bug fix I've It'll done. It'll be an 1140 final. Yes, 11, and 1140 alpha one for that matter, or 1140 beta one. Yeah, it'll, it's, I already coded it. It'll be in 1140 beta as soon as you get it, which will probably be right after you watch this video if you feel like it. Um, so at any rate, x erroneously thought this was an end plate, even though it's not. And so now that's fixed. And so this behaves like this. All right, another one, uh, area rule. Do you know what area rule is? Have you ever heard of area rule? Well, no, but I assume it has to do with the area of the wing. It has something to do with the, the lift, right? Kind of. It's, it's, you're close. Instead of the lift, it's the drag. So here's what it is. Oh, this, this is the top view of a T-38, in my opinion, the most beautiful plane in the world. Is this thing would approach the speed of sound, and in fact, as all airplanes approach the speed of sound, the air gets all bunched up over the wing, right? I mean, the air can't get out of the way fast enough. And so what somebody figured out is that if you make the fuselage skinnier, to make up for the fact that you were picking up wing area, it would reduce drag because instead of bunching up over the wing and you know, shock waves and build up, it would have a way to go, ah, and get out of the way. Well, I have you a see? question real quick. Uh -huh. It's 
may not be related, but I've seen planes when they break the sound barrier sometimes, they'll have a still image, and there'll be this sort of cloud thing that shoots Right. Out. Is that anything to do with this? Uh, kind of, sort of. I mean, you are seeing the formation of shock waves, and the shock waves uh, heat and cool the air in such a way that clouds can form for a moment, okay? Because there's so much pressure change, there's huge temperature change, right? Well, Ideal gas law. just busted through a cloud. I, like wall a wall, right, yeah. right. So that, I mean, if you look at that, you kind of start to get a sense of the insane drag that's involved in trying to punch the sound barrier and so we'll do anything to reduce the drag of the sound barrier. And one of the ways we do it is say, all right, rather than having the air all bounce up or bunch up or press up against the wing, give it a way to escape. And so you narrow out the fuselage where the wings are. And so the cross-sectional area, the cross-sectional area of the airplane is not changing. And so since the cross-sectional area isn't changed as you move along the, the long axis of the airplane, sure, you know, it doesn't get a lot wider here. So sure, yeah, it, it changes the, 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 the cross-sectional shape, but not the area. So the air at least can get out of the way by going into the little space, like little hiding place that's provided, so to speak. So you can get out of the way of the wing by going to where the fuselage isn't because they necked in the fuselage. So this is called area ruling. It reduces drag around the speed of sound because it lets the air go have a place to hide to get out of the way when that wing is just barging its way in at the speed of sound. And uh, so we have improved area ruling effect in X-Plane for 1140. And you're gonna go into Plane Maker and um, anybody that gets the bait, I'll probably send a little text document that outlines this stuff. But in Plane Maker, you can go and say, well, what percentage area ruled is the airplane? And you can kind of say, oh, it's 50% area ruled, which means that it's like 50% of the way to uh, having a constant area from lead to tail, which just kind of lets area rule lower the drag, basically. It's, it's kind of a correction factor to a certain degree. But you can get your T-38s and F-5s and whatnot, you know, going just the right speed, you know, and going through the speed of sound in just the right conditions. So it's just a little bit of tuning there. Um, all right, next is seaplane dynamics. So the seaplanes are kind of going, rrr, 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 you know, in the past, uh, the wave was a sine wave. Right? I had a sine wave for the wave. Now I've changed that from a sine wave to this type of shape, the shape you actually see waves being with little peaks. And with the little peaks, you see with the, the sine wave, the airplane kind of get into resonance. It's sharper, but each sharp point is, doesn't have nearly as much volume. Right? There's not nearly as much volume here as here. Right? I mean, look at the volume here, you know, in the upper half of this compared to the upper volume in here in the upper half of this. And so actually this gives a much smoother ride, right? Seaplanes were kind of like, ooh, this gives a smoother ride because there's a lot less volume in the peak. And also um, I, I kind of added some damping to the fuselage where rocking in the waves also has to move the water. Um, so uh, the, the seaplane should handle a, a decent bit uh, nicer now on the waves. Uh, and then the final change, well, the final major change, I'm only showing the major stuff here. There's been dozens of minor things that are too small for me to take up your time with them. But uh, the final major change is the delta CL. It's a change in coefficient of lift uh, due to ailerons uh, going up and down. Basically, I just looked up more NACA tech reports to see how much the lift and drag change need to flex the ailerons, elevators, and rudders. And uh, just based on researching more NACA tech reports, I took like an average of like all the reports I could find. Like, it was like three or four reports on the subject. I kind of took the average of them to dial in this lift change based on just basically more research, come up with kind of an average. So anyway, these are the major uh, changes in flight model. What to, for 1140, what's interesting to me is people have always been complaining, oh, it's too sensitive, and so this should largely address that, and the waves are too strong, and this should largely address that. So it's getting that delay in prop wash and the shape in the waves with the volume of the peak. And then all the other stuff uh, is really good as well. This uh, and this should really help with the uh, crosswind landings on tail draggers as well, or crosswind takeoffs at least, maybe so not landings. this is getting extremely detailed in the flight model. Yeah. Do you have any insight or anything as far as the competitors do you think i mean this is even would they look at this and be like oh we haven't even gotten to this at all i mean do you have any yeah. insight as to i mean this just sounds way above anybody's head that would be right. working in a competitive product i i don't i don't know I bet money, but I don't know, so I prefer not to say. Let me put it this way. I decided long ago that the way I want to make my business is by building the best business I can, not by taking anyone else's down. So it, yeah. let, let me put it this way. So Microsoft, we've all seen their video, right? right? It looks awesome. It looks great. Absolutely great. But trailers always look great. 
Yeah, 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 the trailer to Star Wars is number one. Look great, right? right. Now with Jar Jar Binks, he's awesome. But uh, I have a feeling, just my gut reaction based on what I've learned about Microsoft Flight Sim is it's going to be amazing. It's just going to be awesome. But what's interesting is that actually has no impact on me. Do you remember when X-Plane was born? You weren't, you weren't doing shipping for X-Plane back then. I was totally solo at first. Yeah, you were shipping them out of your house, but you yeah. were charging like five hundred dollars initially. Yeah, it was, for, it was know, pro niche. only basically. Yeah, pro yeah it was pro use basically. only, and that we still, now we charge seven hundred and fifty bucks for the pro license. But um, X-Plane was born when Microsoft Flight Sim ninety five was out, right? I'm no stranger to being in the market at the same time as Microsoft. And what's interesting is Microsoft has got like tries to go for like the mass market appeal and the beautiful graphics and all that. And it looks like this new Microsoft Flight Sim is absolutely going to do that. It looks like it's going to be great. Explain hits the math and the physics to really get the flight models perfect. This is how Explain was born. If you were to go back in time to, to 1995, it's actually nothing's changed. It's almost, this is almost like a trip back to 1995. It's 1995 all over again when Explain was started. And so here I, I continue to do what I've always done, which is just hit the physics, hit the math, and get the airplane to fly just exactly like the real airplane, including if you enter your own aircraft design in Plane Maker. So I already thought you had everything with the flight model figured out, but clearly there's always something else you could do. Right. What's that next thing that you haven't done? What's the next thing I haven't done? I don't know. I feel like I'm getting darn good in the flight model because we actually used X-Plane to put our eVTOL through its paces and the real eVTOL has agreed with X-Plane hugely and the few areas where X-Plane hasn't captured the eVTOL actual performance, I've updated X-Plane's flight model as I've just uh, shown you in a few areas here. Your to-do to list on the flight model is complete, but that doesn't mean you couldn't add something to that to-do list. Right. I currently have no uh, hair alert, you know, hair on fire, as we call it, or red alert uh, flight model updates in X-Plane. Instead, it's just a steady stream of people saying, oh, what about this airplane? Oh, well, what about this report I found? Oh, well, you're, you're off a little bit in this strange, you know, interesting configuration. Here's a tech report I found to get that. I mean, like, for example, out of the blue, some guy says, well, what about the thrust of the exhaust stacks? Oh, yeah. And I was like, oh, that doesn't matter. He's like, are you sure? I see effective horsepower that's different than shaft horsepower. And I was like, oh, my God, you're right. And it's not a huge difference. And so it kind of flew under the radar for all this time. But now that I found that I've gotten it. And this will continue. So, yeah, I don't have any red alert flight model stuff on my plate because I've knocked it all out for 1140 but of course there's going to be more stuff in the future. Now if someone has a third party plane that they just purchased from you know they have the TV 0900 right. or whatever right. all this stuff just integrates in with those add-ons? As long as you check the experimental flight model box yes. See that's the thing about X-Plane that's different from Microsoft or any other flight sim. But why do you have to check a box for this stuff to work? Because, because if you be, because Ben Sutnick. Ben Sutnick said and Ben Sutnick as you probably know is like my right hand oh, he's man. he's the party pooper. Yeah he's the party pooper. <laughs> he's like no Austin if you put all this cool stuff in some people will be surprised and confused and we don't want people to be surprised and confused. We want them to have the same thing today that they had yesterday so they aren't surprised and confused and so if you don't check the experimental flight model box the flight model will stay the same as it's been for a long time and that way no one will suddenly be like oh no the world changed and now I feel unmoored and I don't know what to do you know uh, so when you want to operate the way I operate which is to throw away the past in five seconds flat and jump forwards turn on the experimental flight model and you'll get all this stuff and remember x is a blade element theory sim so that means all the airplanes that you fly, including third-party add-on airplanes, including the X-Plane airplanes, and including what airplanes you yourself create in Plane Maker to visualize and experience your dreams of flight, this applies to all of them because that's what Blade Element Theory does. It applies this math to the shape that was entered in Plane Maker. That's Blade Element Theory. So um, everybody gets the benefits if they turn on the little box to get them, the experimental flight model. One more thing, uh, I started to walk out the door there and then remembered I wanted to come back and add. There is a certain piece of technology that is making everything you see here possible uh, in these YouTube videos. And that is, believe it or not, Tesla. So Mike, how far are you from my house, would you estimate? About uh, three miles, four miles? Yeah, this office oh, from my house, about um, three or four miles. I would say four to five. Yeah, four to five miles. And it's that nasty traffic all on Gervais and, and Maine yeah. and all that. If I was driving a gas-burning car, I promise you I would not be coming out here. I'd be like, oh, God. 
and I have to drive the car again and I got to hit the gas station and things that are going which is just makes traffic miserable because I'm driving a Tesla Model 3 I like am looking for an excuse to go out and go for a drive and it's like because I mean the phone the car it charges in the garage like a phone it handles like a go-kart it does 0 to 60 in 3.2 seconds it makes no noise doesn't require an oil change doesn't use gas and doesn't shift gears and so it's like it's an excuse to drive a lot of time when I come out here I'm like I think I'm gonna go for a drive and make a YouTube video at Mike's if I didn't have a Tesla I would not be out here making these videos and then you have what Pandora or Oh, service. oh, Tesla has all the, you can get music that like comes from satellites and it's still personalized to you. And so you're always listening. I mean, I've never listened to a commercial in my Tesla before. It's just, uh, you, you choose little like channels and stuff that come from satellite. I don't even, I mean, I don't pay for it and I don't listen to commercials. I don't even know how it all works. All I know is I all have all music all the time when I'm driving. And so it literally makes like trips around town so fun that it actually causes me to make trips I wouldn't otherwise make, including just, you know, throwing my Macintosh into the, in my Tesla and woo, drip, you know, zip it on out here for a presentation. And one thing I just want to point out, and I pointed, the, pointed this out before, I'm going to mention it again. In South Carolina, the car dealership lobby has made it illegal for Tesla to come into the state and have showrooms to show you the car. The car dealerships are literally trying to hide from you how much better the Tesla is than all the other gas burning cars. And Mike, how, do you, how good do you think Teslas are? You drove my wife's Model S the other day. What do you think? It's pretty amazing. I mean, it's <laughs> everything about it is great. Uh, I was amazed it was only what it, you know, 84, I think, yeah, I think 84 grand. So my wife has kind of a, a slightly fancyish Model S at I mean, 84 grand. The Model just, 3 is cheaper. It's like uh, the current Corvette. Maybe not yeah. the new Corvette coming out, but right. the current Corvette. But yet it drives like, you know, uh, a, a BMW right. or, uh, 7 Series. You know, yeah. Like, in complete you know, not silence. The BMW 7 series and the route right. quality and everything. But then you have this huge screen of information and right. it's showing you when a car is next to you on the screen and yeah. it's just right. dripping with technology. Right, yeah. I mean, it, it basically it drives like a BMW, fast as a Corvette, doesn't use gas, and the map is like this. You can see where you're going and where the traffic is, and it does it in complete silence. So there is zero stress zero shifting gears and even being stuck in traffic it's not as bad in a tesla because it's like sitting on your living room sofa in traffic right completely comfortable completely silent listening to music if you feel like it. even traffic isn't as bad and so it's literally having a tesla model 3 that caused me to come out here and just be like eh, it's a saturday morning i guess i'll go for a drive who cares if it's a little traffic you go through drive and uh, do a video at mike's so i just want everybody to know uh, the oil industry is doing everything they can to stop the uh, adoption of Teslas. The, um, if you, there's a YouTube video called like the Tesla Conspiracy where they outline a lot of this. I highly recommend seeing it. It was the oil industry apparently that's constantly shorting the Tesla stock to try and drive the price down uh, to try and stop adoption. Um, I know for an absolute fact, because I have the emails that will be coming out in a documentary I'm making about it, that the uh, car uh, dealership lobby is blockading Tesla from being able to come in and give test drives. And uh, speaking of the new Corvette, uh, the General Motors president actually was on board with and confirming that Tesla could not open a showroom uh, in his home state. So the guy that is in charge of the Corvette doesn't want you to be allowed to drive a Tesla. It, uh, driving it around as a pace car? Oh, I don't know if it's the same guy or not. I think it was. Okay, uh, maybe so. I, I don't know. It's like the president of Chevy, but they yeah. some, one of these guys, the executives at Chevy, was right. driving a Corvette around. And, and he crashed and he, it. Yeah, he crashed and he thought he was going to do a little, like, you know, yeah. a drift around a car. Yeah, and, and he, he crashed. crashed. Right. Okay, so we've all crashed cars before. I've crashed cars before. I don't want to be too negative about somebody crashing a car, but when he says, let's make it illegal for you to see the competition. Uh-uh, no dice. That needs to be called out. And um, to, to whatever degree the car dealers and General Motors and the oil industry will try to make it illegal for you to see a Tesla, I am going to counteract them and tell you how awesome they are. And my only regret with Tesla is I didn't get one a lot sooner because it is literally a lifestyle changer. All right, and that was the final little point I wanted to put on the end of this presentation.